Hello everyone. Hi, my name is Greg Leparati. I'm Associate Director of Alumni Relations here at Baruch College. So happy to have you here with us this evening. Please put in the chat where you're Zooming from. It's always great to see where people are joining us uh, from in the world. We've had some people from all across uh, the country, all across the world. Uh, it was very interesting the one time we had someone from Australia in one of our uh, events. So if you're in Australia, definitely let us know. Uh, Hope everyone, I see a lot of New York in the chat. Excellent, I'm in Queens as well. Welcome. Uh, very happy to have Alan Chen with us here this evening. He'll be presenting yet another financial literacy topic. Uh, and today's topic is particularly interesting to me because full disclosure, I know next to nothing about cryptocurrency. Uh, so this is going to be a very interesting, uh, interest, interesting introduction to the topic. People can make up their minds whether it's something worth considering further. Uh, we'll hear about you know, Alan's research on it and some of his opinions on it, which is going to be fascinating. Some quick ground rules for the evening. Uh, you can turn on your cameras. It's great to see alumni uh, in the audience, but please mute your microphone so we don't have any ambient noise distract us. You can direct your questions and comments to the chat and we will try to respond to most of it um, as it as it rolls in. Um, and if we don't get to anything, we will have some questions at the end. And there may be time at the end to, or we'll let you unmute your microphone if anyone wants to uh, share a comment that's a little too long for the for the chat or something. Uh, but we'll save that for the end because we do have a lot to get through in our presentation. So a quick introduction of Alan. You know, he graduated from Baruch in 2017, I believe, and uh, you would have thought graduating from a great business school, he would know how to manage his finances. But surprisingly, first job he got out of college, he did not know what to do with his money. Uh, because financial literacy is not taught, um, is not taught to people in college or really in, an, in a, you know, as needed type basis for people. So Alan, who comes from a low income immigrant uh, family, uh, sort of learned on his own about financial literacy. He taught himself, became something of, a, of an armchair expert. And uh, he wants to share that tips, those tips and that knowledge with other alumni. We're so grateful he wants to do that and has been uh, such a great host of these financial literacy events for a number of years now. Uh, so all that being said, um, again, please direct questions and comments to the chat. Um, and uh, this is being recorded. So if you miss anything, you will be able to check it out again. Without further ado, Alan Chen. Thanks, Greg. I appreciate the introduction. Uh, one last thing on that is that the slides will be shared out as well. So that will be available towards the end. Um, and welcome to the Financial Literacy Workshop. Is there an echo? Is anyone else hearing an echo in here? I don't personally hear an echo. It might be on your own audio, Joel. So um, perhaps try, uh, let's see. I don't know, uh, but perhaps try, oh, you have an echo as well, Mark. Hmm. Now, I don't hear an echo, but perhaps is it my voice that's echoing or is it is it Alan's or everyone's? Yeah, is it my voice that's echoing? No. Not on your end. Okay. No echo. Okay. All right. Thank you, everyone. So yeah, it might be on on your audio's end. Perhaps try to oh, disconnect from the audio. See, I'm going to mute some people to make sure we have. Hopefully, that fixed it. Um, yeah. But perhaps try to leave the Zoom and come back in. Hope it works out. Feel free to send me some messages in the chat if you need any additional assistance. You can directly message me. Anyway, Alan, take it away. Yeah, great. There's an echo. Let me know if otherwise the recording will capture most of it. So there's that at the very least. All right, then welcome to Financial Literacy Workshop. I usually host these workshops on a monthly basis for college students and alumni of Brew College. If this is your first time coming, welcome. If you're a returning caller, happy to have you back, right? It's always exciting to talk about that. So today is about introduction to cryptocurrency. And cryptocurrency is an interesting topic that most people don't really know much about, but it's talked a lot about in the news. So hopefully I can shine some light on it. I'm gonna to try to remain unbiased. I know there's a lot of strong opinions with cryptocurrency, um, usually in the pros and cons, or if some people are really for it and some people are really against it. I'll try to make, you know, have an unbiased approach to it and try to 
have folks do their own research and really dig into the details and then decide for yourself if it works for you. Now, before I jump too deep into that, just a quick introduction to add on to what Greg has already mentioned. Um, so, you know, Greg mentioned I come from a low income English speaking, not English speaking um, immigrant parents. You know, they didn't really know about financial literacy. Saw myself, they definitely didn't know about cryptocurrency. So that's something that was like way beyond them and something that I dabbled in a little bit at the beginning of my uh, career and just got into it a little bit, but not too deep in, right? And I'll talk about why in a little bit. Graduated in 2017. Since then, I've hosted roughly 40 plus volunteer workshops of various topics and then two pay workshops where I worked with companies. Um, and the last point here is that it's not a surprise. I lost 5.72% of my investment in crypto investments. Um, as of yesterday, I'm sure the numbers have changed drastically today based on how cryptocurrency works um, and crypto investments in general. Everybody just wanted to share that information. You know, I'm not your crypto millionaire retiring at, uh, at you know, my, in my early 20s, which you hear about sometimes. I'm just your everyday guy put some money into crypto and lost some money, right? And I'll talk about it and my research behind that. Whether it's good or bad is debatable considering I lost money, but it depends how you want to take it. All right, then. Quick disclaimer, right? I'm talking about financials. Um, my full-time job is a software engineer, right? So I am not a financial advisor and I'm not an attorney. So take all this information as a, you know, sort of a, a learning opportunity, you know, make sure to you do your own comprehensive research before making financial decisions. And the disclaimer is if you are looking for a licensed professional, find one, right? Don't rely solely on my presentation for that. And of course, if you have questions, please, please put it in the chat and we'll address them along the way. All right, so to further you know, have more transparency, the two cryptocurrencies that I own are XRP and Ethereum, right? So some of you might be wondering, what is that? Um, I won't dive too much into them. Um, another way to look at them is that we've all heard about Bitcoin, right? So these are just other currencies besides Bitcoin. And there are a lot of currencies out there. So just to give us an idea and paint a picture, this is coinmarketcap.com. And let me just paste that link into the chat as well. Uh, and basically this is where you can see the values of most of the cryptocurrencies that are out there and available for the uh, folks to see and invest in. So there's a whole bunch. Uh, I own Ethereum, which is the second largest by market cap and then XRP, which is the sixth largest by market cap. So there's a whole bunch of cryptocurrencies out there. Everyone knows about Bitcoin. It's all the way up here. And then there's a whole bunch. You, the list sort of goes on and on, right? So you have a lot of options in terms of what to invest in. The real question is how do you figure out what's a good investment and what's a bad investment? Um, or maybe you don't care about the money. Maybe you care about the project and the vision, right? So it's really about deciphering and understanding what exactly you want to get involved in and which one of these projects you want to uh, invest your time and money into. All right, so some quick, you know, facts and sort of information for folks, uh, according to the Pew Research Center. So I'm left a great comment. Currently, I have such a major loss of crypto. My brain hurts just looking at my statements. I get that. Uh, <laughs> at one point, I was at a major loss as well. Uh, cryptocurrency is not for the faint of heart. Um, so just to paint a better picture about the U.S. adults um, in relation to cryptocurrency and their knowledge of it, you know, the Pew Research Center states that in their survey that roughly 16% of U.S. adults have ever invested, traded, or bought cryptocurrency, right? And then 70% have never done so, right? So only 16% of people actually have bought it. And these are just adults, right? So if you really look at that and the disproportionate amount of news articles that we get, on when Bitcoin has reached the high or when it has reached the low, it's pretty crazy, right? You would expect more people to own cryptocurrency, but that's not true, right? So if you've never owned cryptocurrency at all, you're definitely in the majority, right? So you're not alone there and that's fine, right? This is a good place to get started and get involved. And to break that down further, of those 16%, right? 46% of those people had you know, worse than the expected returns, right? So they lost money likely, 
right? So for the people who lost money investing in crypto, you're also not alone. A lot of people are actually not performing great in crypto for many reasons. Um, and as some people, you know, 50%, this is where your crypto millionaires are sitting, right? Um, and probably a much smaller subsector of that. Uh, not Most people did not become millionaires with cryptocurrency. It's possible, right? It happened. Uh, but the vast majority of people probably lost money or didn't make much money, right? It's just, uh, where we're standing when it comes to cryptocurrency. Interesting comment from folks. Cryptocurrency is why the banks are in trouble. It is not money. It has no medium of exchange that undermines the U.S. dollar. Very, very interesting. Very strong comments and very good to see engagement in the chat just because, you know, some people may think it's true. Some people may think otherwise, but it's good to see that people are definitely thinking about cryptocurrency and how it has such an outsized impact on our economy, especially from a, a news point of view, right? Even though most people don't actually own cryptocurrency. All right. So I've gotten many questions in the past about cryptocurrency um, and how is it a get rich quick scheme? So I'm going to put it out there right now. Cryptocurrency and related assets are not an easy way or a fast way to make money. A lot of people think because they hear about all these news articles about how people are talking up about it. You know, everyone's uncle and aunt is invested in cryptocurrency, right? That's what it sounds and feels like. But in reality, it's not a quick way to make money, right? It's more likely that when you invest your money, you're probably going to lose it, right? That's more likely to, to happen when it comes to cryptocurrency. It doesn't mean you shouldn't invest in it, right? There are winners in cryptocurrency as well. But statistically speaking, you're probably not going to be a winner in that area. All right, so... Let's talk about cryptocurrency, right? What exactly is cryptocurrency? What is mining to create crypto and how does that mine crypto get to be a currency for purchase? It's a good, that's a good question. We'll talk about that in a little bit after we get through uh, the next two slides, I believe we have a section on like, maybe not mining in depth, but a portion of it is, is about mining. So cryptocurrency is a form of digital assets based on a network that is distributed across a large number of computers, right? Very technical, doesn't mean a lot to folks on this call, right? If you want to dig more deeper into it, there is the Investopedia link there, and then you can see you know, them explain in more detail. I'm gonna try to explain it very high level in hopes that you, know, you have a basic understanding of the idea behind cryptocurrency. Um, great question, what's the point of investing in it if you're more likely to lose your money? Well, it depends on if you're investing in it for the purpose of making money or for a long-term vision for what the project stands for, right? So cryptocurrency not only serves as a point of investment, a lot of people actually invest in it because of a purpose or a vision that the project serves, right? which we'll talk more about as well. Uh, okay, so key parts about cryptocurrency, right? A lot of people talk about how it functions as a currency, right? Um, and to be clear, from the point of view of the US government, Federal Reserve and the IRS, it is not currency, right? So that part we need to you know, get out of the way. Um, and the key parts of cryptocurrency are that mainly you can buy, sell and trade it, right? It's a very volatile asset. They want to treat it as currency. So in other words, you should be able to use it to purchase things. You should be able to sell it. You should be able to trade it, right? Most cryptocurrencies usually allow for this, right? At least the very popular ones. And there are even some companies that are accepting it as payments, in, especially for the more popular cryptocurrencies. So that's one key part of cryptocurrency. And as folks have mentioned in the chat already, it's uh, very volatile, highly volatile. So the value can jump and change throughout the day. And since it's sort of like a, you know, your stock market is open between certain hours. Cryptocurrency is open all the time. It's always trading, right? So it's very volatile. And because it's volatile, you know, because of how volatile it is, one week you can see their investments are up 50%. The next week they could be down 50%, right? So it's not for the faint of heart and definitely not a short-term investment. And also not something you should probably throw your life savings into. 
right? Because of how volatile it is. There's no guarantee it will go up, or if it does go up, there's no guarantee it'll stay there. Right? That's the whole point of it being volatile. But some experts would argue that you know the high volatility kind of defeats the purpose of it being classified as a currency or the attempt at classifying it as a currency. Because you know, if you have you know, a unit of currency, you would expect to buy something of the same value today and tomorrow, or at least a similar value. Now, you don't expect to, you don't want to pay double the price for the whatever item you're purchasing the next day. So the volatility does get in the way of classifying it as a true currency. Right? It's something to keep in mind. All right. Someone asked about good old uh, mining, which we'll talk about in a little bit right here. So most cryptocurrencies are powered by something called the blockchain, right? So to be clear, blockchain is completely separate in terms of technology from the cryptocurrency. It just happens to power cryptocurrency, right? So it can serve many other purposes, but it happens to power cryptocurrency. Um, a lot of people have heard the term and admittedly, it's probably confusing and it is something that we should try to understand even in a little bit, right? Because it's important to ensuring the stability and trust in the system, which is funny when you say it, given how volatile it is, but it does provide some stability to the system. All right, so I stole this chart from Bloomberg about the blockchain, which I'm gonna dive into. It's a great question. Can you elaborate on how the blockchain empowers cryptocurrency? We're gonna talk about it a little bit right now. So you can think of the blockchain as sort of a virtual ledger, right? As you know, for a ledger, you record transactions on that ledger. When you buy or sell something, it's recorded on that ledger. That ledger is public information for everyone. And the above steps here, you can basically see how that decentralization plays into writing onto that ledger. So in step one, for example, if A were to send funds to B, right? You want to send some cryptocurrency over to your friend over there, right? So that's step one. Step two, what happens is that that's considered a transaction, right? When you trade cryptocurrencies or you send it over, it's a transaction. That transaction is added to a block, right? So a block is just a bunch of transactions from multiple people, right? So you can think of it like, you know, if you went to a bank and you were to withdraw, exchange cash, uh, and they write all of those transactions onto a piece of paper, that's a block, right? Just a record of everyone's transactions, right? That block is then broadcasted out to a bunch of computers, a bunch of users who will then take that information. And in step four, they would validate it, right? When I say validate it, uh, what I don't mean is, you know, it's not someone just sitting at a computer and go, hey, you know, A gave money to B, looks good to me. Let's just check up on that because, you know, fraud can easily happen like that. What happens is a very mathematically intensive computation to reach the same answer for all of these machines, right? So there's a lot of math involved in that. I won't dig too much into the detail. The whole goal of it is that in step four, you have a distributed set of users who don't know each other and they all have to check the work of the block, right? Is the block accurate? Is it true? Is there any fraud happening, right? And they'll use very computationally cryptographic methods where the crypto part of cryptocurrency comes from, you know, to basically determine if the block is accurate or not, right? Is one way to look at it. And then once they decide, Hey, everything looks good. The block is good. All the transactions in the block is accurate. Then that block is added to a blockchain, right? So it's like a chain of blocks, which is really just a chain of transactions, right? The transactions were recorded into blockchain. And then anyone, you know, you or I could literally go on the public ledger and find out who sent money to who and how much did they send. Right, and all of its associated information. So it's public domain knowledge. The part that's not public is 
who the people are, right? So when you look at this area here where it's like transfer from, transfer to, it's not like it's saying transfer from Alan Chen to transfer to Gray, right? It's basically a bunch of random digits and letters that make no sense to anyone. But that's the whole point of you can confirm transactions and make sure everything's correct without having to review who you, who you are. But the information is always going to be public, right? And since every computer has to, or every, uh, I guess computer is a good way to put it, but every person in step four has to validate the transactions. You can't just decide, hey, I'm going to change the blockchain, the public ledger. So though it's public out there, it's very difficult to manipulate and commit fraud, right? It's not impossible, but it can't happen. All right, we got some questions here. So let me just answer some of these in case it's related to the chart I'm seeing here. Um, my understanding is that crypto is a digital asset where Bitcoin is always depicted as a physical coin. Is it physical or not? It is a digital asset, it is not physical. That's the whole point of uh, cryptocurrencies. Um, there are some marketing gimmicks where they make it physical for whatever reason, but for the most part, it is a digital asset. Um, it lives in data, not in your hand anywhere. You can't touch it. Any risk of potential money laundering activities along blockchain based on digital asset transactions? Yes. Uh, blockchain reduces bad actors, right? Because of its distributed network, uh, but it's not impossible. Right, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, sometimes the math is just bad, right? Like step four can go horribly wrong. And if it goes horribly wrong for everyone, then the ledger is gonna be incorrect, right? So far, the large um, cryptocurrencies haven't ran to that issue and wasn't able to overcome it, right? There's, if it does go bad, there's ways that you can split off and correct it. Right. And then there's many like theories about if you should or shouldn't do that, if it still, you know, aligns with the main point of blockchain technology. But there's ways to work around it. Where does the personal info live? The info that ties the account to the individual. Uh, we'll talk about that in a little bit. Right. It lives in something called a wallet, which is something you should keep to yourself and not share with anyone else. Uh, but basically, it allows you access to uh, this address, if you will, or right? think of it like that. Um, is it potential for laundering activity traceable? Um, it depends. If you don't share your wallet, then it's not traceable. If you share your wallet, then it's traceable. So <laughs> it depends on the level of information that folks who are, I guess, investigating the money laundering activity have access to, right? Is it traceable to law enforcement? Yeah, same idea, it depends, right? Uh, I think ideally it's not, right? Ideally it's completely anonymous, no one knows what's happening, right? It's a public ledger, but you don't necessarily know who's transacting on it. But that's to say if people don't have additional information to track you down, Right, so let's we'll dig into that in a little bit as well. Uh, all right, just yeah. Someone asked when you have shared. When you say shared, what do you mean? When I say shared, um, it means that the information is just public out there, right? As long as you don't. Basically, it's like a password, right? If you don't show your password to anyone, they can't get into your account. If you show your password to someone, they're gonna know who you are. Right, so that's the thing with blockchain. Okay, so we'll talk about how we store cryptocurrency in a little bit, which will hopefully highlight how it's anonymous and how it's not anonymous, depending on how you want to look at it. Uh, let's talk about NFTs next, right? NFTs, huge headlines everywhere. We see it everywhere in relation to cryptocurrency. Similar, not exactly the same thing. Um, and it comes up a lot because NFTs are powered by the blockchain and they basically represent ownership of a unique digital asset, right? So NFTs can be bought and sold. For the time being, you can think of them as collector's items, right? Some people like to collect certain items and NFTs are one example of that. They just happen to be 
completely digital. Here's one example of an NFT on OpenSea, which is one of the largest NFT marketplaces out there. Think of it like uh, your eBay or Amazon of NFTs. You go on this site and purchase digital assets. So this is a doodle number 5607. And you can see that it's a piece of art. Um, once you purchase it, then the ownership is recorded onto the blockchain. No one else owns this piece of art except you. Everyone knows you own it because it's a public ledger. So everyone can see, hey, this person at this address owns this NFT. And you can't clone it because you wouldn't own it, right? It would be someone, something completely different. So yes, you can still take a screenshot. You can still make duplicates and copies of it. But everyone on the blockchain knows that you are the only true owner, right? So is it useful? Depends on who you ask, right? When it comes to these questions. But with all that said and done, this specific NFT is selling for $6,618.18 at the very moment I took the screenshot, which was around yesterday, right? Do people actually buy it? I mean, you've seen the headlines uh, that yes, they do. Just like how some people buy very expensive, expensive pieces of art, we can apply the similar line of reasoning here. There are differences, but I don't want to dig too deep into those, de into those details, but people are actually buying digital art you know, for $6,000 and more. Right? Some NFTs are much more expensive. Right? A lot of people can consider NFTs as a form of investment. You can make money or lose money if that's, your, if that's how you want to uh, view it. Right? There are other NFT projects that serve different purposes. Right? Some NFTs allow you access to events right? or clubs right? or specific groups. So depending on how you want to look at it, NFTs can serve a purpose uh, of entry right? or there are other useful purposes of it depending on what that group is trying to achieve. I can put the website for NFC, uh, uh, NFTs, OpenSea. I think yes. I got it in there, Alan. Yeah. Great. Yeah, thank you for the support, Greg. Um, yes, only one person can buy this digital asset, 5607. No one else can buy it. Of course, unless you buy it and you decide to sell it again. So I guess the better way to answer that question is only one person can own 5607 five, in the world. Right? No one else can own it. And you have proof of ownership. Think of it like a, a deed to your home. Right? Your deed shows that you own your home. Same idea here. You can prove that you own this piece of art once you buy it. Uh, all right, then. Let's talk about crypto wallets. Right? Someone asked, how do, you, how do you keep your cryptocurrency, right? Cryptocurrencies and NFTs are stored on the blockchain, right? Transactions, all the information is stored on the blockchain. Public ledger, remember, everyone can see it. Your wallet holds the keys to access your digital assets, right? Like I mentioned before, you can think of it as a really long password that you can't remember. So you either have to write it down on a piece of paper somewhere, or store it on a piece of software or device, All right? So there's many types of wallets. Usually there's a trade-off between convenience and security, right? The best type of wallet is a piece of paper. If you write it down on a piece of paper, no one can hack you. The only way they can get the piece of paper and the password on it is if they break into your home and steal it, right? A lot of people tend to prefer to keep their password um, on a piece of software online, right? As long as it's connected to the internet, people can steal it, right? They can hack it. It's more easily accessible by hackers, right? So your wallet, you can think of it like it holds a list of keys that you can use to access your digital assets, right? And it proves that you own it. Now, someone asked, hey, can you track down legal activity? If you own the wallet, and uh, if authorities were to find you with said wallet, then they can sort of connect the one and one, you know, the two and two together. But hey, you own the wallet, 
So you must own these digital assets. So you made all these transactions for said activity because it's a public ledger, everyone can see it. Then they can sort of connect the dots, right? But as long as they don't have access to it, then it's sort of, you know, you don't know who's transacting on the, on the blockchain. Uh, so in simple terms, NFTs are like a digital asset, like collector's item. Yeah, I'll put it like that. It's like a collector's item, right? Um, there's artwork tied to it. It's a unique asset. That's the whole, that's the point of the non-functional, fungible part, right? NFT stands for non-fungible token. So it's a unique digital asset. Are you saying the wallet password cannot be updated to owner specification? Uh, yeah. It's it basically points you to a specific area. So you can't just be like, so you can change your wallet, but you're that's literally changing one long password for another long password. And to do so, you have to transfer from one wallet to another wallet, right? And then when you transfer, it costs money. So <laughs> so you try to uh, you try to avoid that if you can. Um, but yeah, you know if you forget your wallet, you lose access to your wallet. Uh, it's a done deal. You don't have access to it anymore. It's just lost forever. Um, and it's very unlikely that you're going to guess the really long password. Yeah, seed phrase, right? You want to get more into details, more into nitty gritty, right? Um, into the how the walls work, right? There's um, there's various, uh, you can think of it like keys, right? In terms of how your wallet is secured and how you can access the information. But the takeaway here is if you're going to get serious about investing in cryptocurrency, it's better to have a cold wallet, which is an offline wallet, right? So think of it like a USB. You plug it in and you can access your cryptocurrencies. You unplug it, you can't access it anymore and no one else can either. How can you recover the password then? You can't. Uh, for the most part, if you lose it, it's a, it's a done deal. That's the whole point. That's why it's, supposed to, that's why it's secure. Right? There's no central authority that you can just click forget password. You know, you can't, it's not like Facebook where you can just go, I forgot my password and they'll tell you what your password is. If you lose it, it's gone. So it's very important for you to keep it secure, keep it in a safe, keep it somewhere that is, um, that you know will be a secure location. Right? And obviously if you were to share your wallet with everyone, everyone could just take your money. So don't do that either. Uh, all right then, well, let's talk about how you can buy cryptocurrencies and NFTs. For those of us who have bought before, you might have a different approach that is much more efficient, but this is, think of it like a, a beginner friendly set of steps to buy cryptocurrency and NFTs. Um, first thing you wanna do is um, find a trustworthy digital asset exchange. Um, and digital asset exchange, you know, or exchange is a marketplace where you can trade digital assets for other digital assets or for fiscal currency, right? Like the US dollar, for example. Not all exchanges are created equal, and most of them have fees associated with transactions. It costs money to buy digital assets such as cryptocurrencies and NFTs. And trustworthy is in italics because sometimes the digital asset or digital asset exchange is not trustworthy. They just steal your money, uh, which can happen as a real thing. So make sure to do research in that regard. Uh, once you have that, the second thing is to research the project and its people to understand the mission, investment, and technology, right? Um, there are thousands, if not millions, of different cryptocurrencies and NFT projects. Um, some of them are great. Most of them are honestly terrible uh, and probably most likely not something you want to invest in. Uh, but that's why it's important to do your research to understand the mission, right? What is the cryptocurrency or NFT trying to achieve, right? Is it a good investment, right? Do you see value in that space as it grows and becomes more popular? And does the technology make sense? Most of the time, the technology portion is going to be very mathematically intensive. Uh, which you would see if you read their, their white papers, which I'll go over in a little bit. Um, you don't have to understand everything, uh, but it's important that you at least have made an attempt 
to understand how it works, right? Are there security flaws? Are there flaws through design and so on? Lastly, once you have that, pick a place to put your digital assets, right? Do you want to store it in a software wallet or a cold wallet? And that's basically all you got to do. Find out where to buy it, find out what you want to buy, and then find out where you want to put it after you buy it. All right, so those are the basic three steps. I have linked a more detailed walkthrough in there for folks who are interested in digging more into the details. Um, but it's much longer than this and much more, um, much more of a deep dive. So there are some questions here. Uh, let's see here. Is there, an, is there an individual or entity that is in charge of the services that store cryptocurrencies for miners or investors? Um, it depends on the digital asset exchange you're using, right? So some digital assets have digital wallets to store your cryptocurrency for you. Now, there are two schools of thought. Right? The first school of thought is if, well, there's only one school of thought really that I guess is really popular. If you don't own your own wallet, then you don't own your cryptocurrency. If the exchange owns your wallet, then the exchange owns your currency, right? If they lock you out of your account, you're out of luck, which we've seen a lot, um, not a lot, but enough to be of concern, right? So a lot of people, that's why a lot of people prefer cold wallets, right? They prefer to buy the exchange, buy digital asset and then transfer it to their own wallet, for example, versus leaving it on the exchange. Uh, here's another one. Just to clarify, when you said sharing your wallet just now, do you mean the password to the wallet or the public facing address for it? The password to the wallet, everyone can see um, sort of like the, the ID, right? That can identify who you are if they were to find information um, that ties you to it, right? That's public information. More about the, uh, the password to, uh, you can think about like the password to the wallet, right? To avoid getting too complicated about it. How's the fundamental value of the cryptocurrency achieved and NST value achieved? Supply and demand, right? The more people want it, then the higher the price will be. Um, since there is no central authority, um, similar to a central bank, such as the US dollar with the Federal Reserve, um, there's no one that regulates it, really, right? You can have regulation around it sometimes, right? So, it gets complicated, right? You can have decentralized regulation and people vote on doing certain things when it comes to the cryptocurrency, right? So Ethereum is a good example. Um, technically, you can have a bunch of people decide majority vote or depending whatever the consensus mechanism is for sake of argument, let's say majority vote. You can decide for the majority vote, we want this cryptocurrency, be, cryptocurrency to be deflationary. Right, which in theory should increase the value of the cryptocurrency because you're taking them out of the pool. Right, so you can make changes to it, but it's much more difficult and the power is much more distributed than just a central bank deciding, hey, we're going to do X, Y, Z, right? You're not going to have the Federal Reserve deciding to increase interest rates that will impact the market. Right? You have to come to consensus with likely a bunch of strangers to decide the future of the cryptocurrency. How do you view the real world application uh, or utility of digital assets like NFT art or digital currency? You think uh, it will be a trend within the realm of alternative investments on a broader sense or just a niche belong to a small group of people? Um, I don't know for now, right? But I- but Here's my question. It's not a currency, young man. It's not a medium of exchange. It doesn't have a unit of account. It doesn't have a store of value. It doesn't have deferred standard of payment. That's the definition of money. So please explain to me, why do you think a cryptocurrency is a currency? It's a... Okay, okay thank you. Thank you, Eric. We said at the beginning, please ask if you'd like to be unmuted. We could save some, some unmuting for the end. But anyway, Alan, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, yeah, just to address Eric's question, right? Um, like I said... It's not a currency, according to the Federal Reserve, right? Um, and well, then why did I say cryptocurrency? 
Yeah. So my point on it, on it is I'm using the term that people are most familiar with, right? Just to explain the topic at hand. And if folks can make their own decisions. Sure. What, right? What is the definition Eric, of money? Please, Tell please, me. Please, Eric, please stop or we're going to have to boot you from this. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think Eric brings, brings up a good point, right? There's definitely people who have multiple views on cryptocurrency, right? Like I said, I just want to provide the information so folks can do their own research and make their own decision, right? So Eric definitely brings up a lot of good points that folks should take a look at. Um, but just to uh, just to move on to the next set. You know, Alan, I, I just wanted to also say real quick for everyone, the basis of this event is really more about discussing the practical usage of cryptocurrency, which is the name it has, uh, and talking about an introduction to it for people who maybe want to learn more about whether it's something they want to explore more. We're not really getting into the some of the headier academic type of issues surrounding uh, cryptocurrency. That could be for a different type of event or panel. Yeah, future. but I have students who lost a lot of money on this, guys. That's the problem. Okay, thank you, Eric. Again, please stop unmuting yourself or we will have to boot you. Uh, go ahead, Alan. Yeah, yeah. So just to go over some more things um, so folks can be aware, uh, cryptocurrency, has been played by fraud in the past year, right? Or in the past years, right? Ever since it really started taking off in around 2017. But I wouldn't say fraud is everywhere in crypto because that's that's a misleading statement, uh, but it's definitely in more places than it should be. If you can see in the FTC um, diagram on the left, you know, uh, this diagram is, I took from 2022, they don't have data on 2023 just yet. Uh, but you can see here that fraud is growing every year uh, just because more folks are becoming interested in cryptocurrency. And there's definitely was a boom during 2020, which was the pandemic time, right? They're saying there's less interest in it as folks go back to work, but obviously something to be aware of. Um, fraud is a concern just because there is a lack of regulation, right? To be clear, um, there's a lack of regulation for cryptocurrency. Um, the Federal Reserve is and SEC, right, are seeing challenges, lawsuits, you name it, around cryptocurrency. So it's very important that you got to do your research, right? And even if you do research, sometimes, admittedly, it's not enough, right? On the right, you can see sort of all the large companies that had fraud associated with them that has impacted a lot of people. Right. It's not a small amount. This is, we're talking like billions of dollars. Right. So it's definitely something that's, you know, top of mind for folks as you get into this. Uh, a lot of people would suggest if you're just starting out, just curious, don't, uh, don't invest a large chunk of your change into cryptocurrency, right? Until you do enough research, uh, you feel comfortable, right? Don't put your life savings into it. Uh, it would be my. Suggestion here, right? FTC, uh, Mount Gox, these are exchanges, right? That a lot of people believed were trustworthy, but they find out that it was just kind of a scam, right? It was just fraud. And they lost a lot of their money. The government had to step in and to sort of find out where did all the money go and try to return assets back to people, right? Terra UST is a cryptocurrency that was believed to be a safe cryptocurrency, right? Tied to the tied to other more physical currencies, but then it plummeted in value. And now the founder is on the run and possibly is looking to be arrested, right? So there's definitely, you know, contested areas of fraud in this area. So just be aware of it as you get into it, or if you want to get into it, right? That's part of the, part of the introduction here. All right, how to verify the legitimacy of cryptocurrency. Uh, there is not one way to do it. Any of you did all of these uh, steps, you won't necessarily uh, find that you're fraud proof, unfortunately, but these are definitely good steps to get started with, right? So founders and organizations, you just have to make sure that they're legitimate, right? Some cryptocurrencies, it literally has 
no founders, everyone's anonymous, you don't know who they are. Uh, maybe not the best organizations to trust. Right? Make sure that you can tie it to a specific person, you can do research on them. And second part is verifying the community and history. Right? There, if there are others who have vetted the project, then you're probably in good company. Right? You but you should still do your own due diligence. Right? This one is tricky because many projects that we saw in the previous slide had seemingly great communities and seemingly a lot of celebrities and influencers supporting it. But you have to remember, celebrities and influencers, if they're being paid to promote something, they're going to do it. And if they don't know any, anything about crypto, then it's not necessarily a community that you want to follow on. right? So it's important that you do research on what exactly is the history of the founders, the folks, and of the project. Right? If, it's been, if it's been around for a long time, like Bitcoin, it's probably not going to fail tomorrow. Does it mean it's fail-proof forever? You know, I can't tell you for sure. Right? But it's still, you know, it's still something that you should um, understand when it comes to your risk appetite. Now, the third thing here that I spoke about a little bit is a white paper. You can think of this sort of like an investment prospectus, right? Or a document that's supposed to convince you to invest with the project, right? Does that mean that it's truthful all the time? Not necessarily, but you should still check if it's professional, legitimate, if it sounds real, or does someone write it in five minutes? Um, this is where you also see some of the math and the cryptographic technology behind it. Someone or someone you know should be able to at least verify it and tell you, does the math seem legitimate? Are they actually doing the math in their technology, right? Or is it not transparent and you can't see anything? And if that's the case, then maybe you can't trust the project. Last point here is check for legal cases and compliance of the SEC. I put a maybe there because a lot of cryptocurrency projects, especially the larger ones, even exchanges now, are running into problems with the SEC, right? which some people can see as a good thing because that puts regulation and compliance into the industry. right? Lack of regulation definitely makes it difficult for us to determine, is the cryptocurrency legitimate? Uh, but all of this also applies to exchanges, right? Anything in that space or area where it lacks regulation, it's important that you try to do due diligence as much as you can and before putting, putting any money in. All right, let's see. We're almost at the end, so I'll get to some of these questions once I wrap up here. Uh, cryptocurrency and taxes. Uh, according to IRS, like I mentioned before, cryptocurrency is not currency. Right, it acts more of an as an asset, right? And assets are taxed. So when you buy and you sell, that's going to be taxed at a capital gains tax. Um, there's other transactions that will be taxed as well. You can find the full list in the link below there. Um, definitely read up on it. If you don't know, don't want to read up on it, hire an accountant because cryptocurrency and taxes can get pretty tricky. Uh, the last thing here is that you want to look for an exchange that will make Tax is easy, right? Um, for example, Coinbase, uh, one of the most popular exchanges in America, does have a section for taxes, right? If your cryptocurrency exchange makes taxes very difficult, uh, it would be it would make it difficult for you as well to uh, keep track and understand how to report your taxes. Uh, but you know you want to make it easy as easy as possible if you're going to be buying and selling cryptocurrency. All right, here. So uh, here we are. If you take anything from this introduction, five things to take away is, you know, you want to explore cryptocurrency and NFTs, right? If this is interesting to you, take a read on some of these links, take a look. Um, you don't want to, you want to start small, right? Try not to dump your life savings into cryptocurrency. Uh, a caution for a lot of folks who might have done that in the past. You've seen it in the headlines. Some people have put their entire life savings in. It's you know, it's, remember, it's not a get-rich-quick scheme, uh, nor is it a guarantee for money, right? So if you're interested, start small. Um, and, you know, you can buy, sell, trade, stake, eat, et cetera. There's a lot of things you can do with cryptocurrency. Just make sure that you understand what you're doing with it. 
right? Don't just uh, follow the crowd. If people say uh, buy the dip, don't just buy the dip because people said buy the dip. Uh, make sure that you understand what you're getting yourself into. Uh, definitely set up a cold wallet for the high security. Some people recommend um, doing that from the get-go if you can, right? Just so you have good practices when it comes to security and you don't leave your wallet with an exchange online who can basically lock you out of your money. And lastly, join online communities to learn more. Right? You don't want to be in a silo when it comes to cryptocurrency, but also acknowledge the fact that uh, you don't want to join like some a community that's almost cult-like, right? That tells you to buy and buy and tells you to uh, uh, get in on specific digital assets. Uh, you definitely want to you know, doubt where you can and do your research um, and understand, hey, is this online community good for me? Or are they just trying to get me to buy more of the cryptocurrency to drive the value up? Right, so it's definitely that's definitely part of it as well. All right, uh, this is my own thing, but uh, one thing to call out here is I do have financial literacy coaching sessions. Right, we can talk about cryptocurrency. We can talk about completely separate topics if you want to, just about um, financials, right? Personal finance. I do have free thirty minute sessions to talk about your financial situation and answer questions. Right, the goal is to teach you to find information that you need and provide additional resources. Um, I have the link there and I can share it above as well. Um, and also it's always going to be free. I'm never going to charge you for it. If, even if you have multiple sessions. So the only challenge is finding time on my calendar. Uh, all right, then last thing here. Uh, if you want to talk, if you want to reach out, you know, definitely send me an email. Always happy to reply and chat. Um, and definitely take a look at my YouTube that has nearly nothing to do with cryptocurrency, more about personal finance. Uh, but Greg really pushed for me to do this topic. So I figured I should sort of give an intro. Um, but definitely check that out if you're interested. And well, oh, wrong link there. Let me send the right link here. Uh, but yeah, otherwise, my thank next you so topic, much, Alan. Yes. I'm going to post the link to the next workshop, which I think is going to be a really interesting one talking about salary transparency and negotiating. Um, and uh, that's in light of some new, uh, some new rules about salary transparency out there. So uh, that should be a very interesting one. Uh, and uh, I, want to, I want to thank you, Alan, for what a very informative session here. I think that uh, as someone right here who has fairly minimal knowledge of cryptocurrency. You really explain things very well. I think also the, the slide about explaining blockchain, as you were describing it, I was thinking, man, this is difficult to understand, but probably even more difficult to explain so concisely. So I think you did a great job there, Alan. So just uh, kudos to you, congrats. <laughs> Definitely appreciate it. Um, yeah, great. Do we have some time to go through some of the questions that we might have? If there are any remaining questions, please type them in. So interesting comment. Wyoming decides to have their own coin. Yeah, a lot of cities are making their own cryptocurrency for, for better or worse. Is that, is what I I'm have saying. a question, Mr. Chen. Mr. Chen, um, what do you think is going to happen to the future of banks given that these cryptocurrencies are starting to re cause bank runs and bank panics that we haven't seen since 2008. It seems like this investment, when it goes sour, really starts screwing up the whole banking system. Uh, I know a lot of people who are worried about uh, Signature Bank because they're so heavily involved in cryptocurrencies. And I don't know if in California, the SVB collapse was due to investing in this. This seems like an investment that's totally unregulated. We don't know what country is mining more than others. Could it be China, for example? We don't know, Mr. Chen. Could it be Russia? Could it be a, a terrorist country mining this? That's really what I think we should talk more about than investing in this very, very dangerous currency. And I'm a full professor, so I'm not trying to be mean, Mr. Klen. I always am open up to new ideas. But thank you, Eric. I did ask to please let me know if you wanted to be unmuted. I thought you were not allowed to unmute yourself, but. Maybe that's my Zoom. Anyway, all valid uh, questions that Eric asks, Alan. Yeah, your, yeah, your thoughts. yeah. Yeah, so the way I see it is that I don't want to um, start from introduction by cautioning everyone that cryptocurrency is 
is the worst thing in the world, right? Um, I definitely want folks to reach their own conclusion. And if they definitely, if they reach the same conclusion as you, Eric, I think that's, that's fine, right? I don't want to prevent folks from doing their own research and digging into the details. I do agree with what you're saying about Signature Bank. Definitely not the best we've seen in our financial system and how it's handled uh, cryptocurrency. Uh, I do think that there are many long drawn out cases um, in cryptocurrency along with the SEC that folks can take a look at. And I definitely encourage people to take a look at, right? If you look at SEC, the type of cryptocurrency, you're gonna find out a whole boatload of information in terms of like, you know, where is the regulation lacking and why do, you know, why do they call themselves a cryptocurrency and so on? Can they call themselves a currency and so on, right? Um, that's something I definitely encourage people to take a look at and draw their own conclusions, right? I, I don't want this to turn into like, here's my opinion and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put it on everyone here and, you know, try to convince everyone that this is the way to go, right? Um, nor am I suggesting that cryptocurrency is the way of the future. Everyone should buy it. Not saying that either, right? The approach is more very much, you know, you can do this, you can do that, but whatever you choose, make sure that you have a good understanding of where you're getting yourself into and do your research, right? Is, is the approach I'm taking here. And I definitely don't want to sway anyone's opinion one way or the other. Very well said, Alan. And as Alan has said at the beginning of all of his financial literacy workshops, he's not a financial analyst. He's not telling you what you should do. Uh, in this case, he's providing an introduction to a topic that's really out there uh, in the news quite a bit. And as Alan also pointed out, I thought the statistics were really quite interesting. How, what, what was it, about 16% of people have dabbled in cryptocurrency uh, as opposed to 76 or 77% have done nothing, um, which is interesting. There's uh, because the amount of the amount of coverage it gets, you would think that number of people who dabbled in it would actually be a little bit higher. So although 16% is still significant, it's not it's not as high as perhaps you would expect. Yeah, definitely. Um, based on the news, you would think everyone's invested in it, right? Um, which is a bad thing if signature bank goes down and everything everyone's invested in it. Uh, but it's definitely having an outsizing impact, I think, on the economy. And we'll find out more as developments play out, right? And who who is impacted and what cryptocurrencies are impacted by it. Um, oh, there, there are some questions, uh, but I know we've reached time. Greg, do you think we have some time to answer some of these questions in the chat? Absolutely, yeah. Go for it. Great. So someone asked a question about the doodle, uh, 5607. Um, can you alter the image slightly by changing the color of the eyes um, or really anything on the image uh, and call it 5608? Um, you, can, you can, but remember, uh, the, the unique thing about the blockchain technology is that every other uh, computer or every other user in the, the ecosystem has to agree with you that 5608 is legitimate. Right? So you can do it, but if they don't agree that it's legitimate, then it's not gonna have any value or as much value as 5607, right? So that's something to, uh, to keep in mind. Um, you definitely have the ability to just copy the image right, and change it however you wish, uh, but the acknowledgement of you owning it and the acknowledgement of everyone else, from everyone else that you own it and giving it its actual value of say $6,000 might not happen, right? So that's something to keep in mind. Uh, all right. What's the difference between crypto and gambling? Uh, that's a tricky one. I would say cryptocurrency and gambling, you can think of it like how you might want to think about uh, the stock market when it comes to risky stocks right? or stocks are, have a higher chance of losing money. Um, it's your version of an educated investment or an educated guess, right? Is some cryptocurrency basically gambling? Probably. I'm not going to say it's not, uh, but there are some cryptocurrencies that might not be uh, because there is 
a supposed use or vision backing it, right? There are some cryptocurrencies that are um, designed to power specific systems, right? For example, uh, a good example is that the cryptocurrency folks uh, mentioned that a lot of cities are starting, right? Does buying a cryptocurrency uh, power specific public uh, utilities, right? Does buying a cryptocurrency actually lead to a useful calls elsewhere, right? So it depends on what the project of the cryptocurrency is for. If it's if you're buying it for the sake of making money, then yes, you know it can be like gambling in some aspects. But cryptocurrency does have um, various other avenues right, or other uses because of its unique blockchain technology. Right. So definitely take a look into that. The white paper should describe more about it as well. That's what I would say is the difference between the two. And gambling is you know you gotcha. trying to make some money or lose it. You know, hard to say. We have um, George in the chat. I was hoping that he could ask a question uh, verbally. Let's see. Okay. George, you should. Oh, sorry, George. Good. Oh, hello. Am, am I coming across? Hi, George. Yes. Okay. Yes. Awesome. Uh, Alan, th thanks again. Um, that that was a fantastic uh, presentation, and honestly, one of the best that I've heard on on this topic. Um, I, I kind of just wanted to to piggyback uh, off what you said because uh, you know apparently there's a lot of emotions involved for people that have uh, invested in this asset class. Um, so you know, I I I I think everything you said was spot on um, for people that think that this is you know. Uh, uh, a currency that it shouldn't, you know, the way I think about it is it's, it's just another asset class. So just like stocks, um, you know, you have to go do your research uh, against uh, a, uh, Apple versus uh, XYZ Corporation. So, so you know, if, if your investment in this asset class uh, declines and, and, you know, you lose a lot of money over it, um, it's, it's not necessarily the, you know, uh, the, 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 it's it's essentially you have to do your own due diligence, um, and and so you know for for people that are kind of you know saying that it shouldn't be called a currency, well you know, you know it, you could think of it as as marketing. Um, so you know we have like plant based meat. Uh, if you guys are familiar with Beyond Meat, you know they're calling themselves meat because that has you know some intrinsic value. Using that word builds trust with the customer. So it's, it's not me. Um, but you know, it's, uh, it, it, again, like the, the principle kind of applies, um, where you, you just kind of do, do your own research. So, um, you know, for, and, and on that point about Silicon Valley bank, uh, you know, if you look into it, if you did the research, you'll realize that they didn't fail because of their investments in cryptocurrencies. They, they failed because they made a bunch of, uh, U.S. long dated treasury uh, purchases, which you know obviously took a hit during inflation uh, when Fed rose the uh, you know hiked the interest rates, and so uh, then you know that all ob obviously you know their their asset values took a deep hit, and then you had the classic blank run. I'm sure every bank in the United States, if all of the depositors suddenly wanted their money back or a large majority, they would also fail. So. You know, just kind of just wanted to get get that clear and also kind of support the arguments. Um, Alan, I'm, I'm definitely going to, you know, reach out to you over Gmail um, because one thing that um, I've always, you know, tried to, you know, this, this has been something that uh, I've been on the edge about, you know, putting my own investments in. Um, and for me, I think maybe, you know, obviously we could talk about it in our personal sessions, but um, what I wanted to know is how could I, create my own cryptocurrency if I wanted to, because, you know, a large part for me in order to kind of like, I, I, I get, you know, I get US dollar, right, backed by the US government. Um, if I wanted to make more money, I could just go out and work. But if I wanted to make more cryptocurrency, I probably can't do that, especially not on a, you know, reasonable scale. Um, so that's something I, I probably would like to set up a session with you to go into going further so but thanks thanks again this was this was fantastic yeah george i appreciate you talking about that um huge kudos to explaining the the situation of the banks right now um 
I think it helps a lot. And now no one has to read the news about those bank situations because you've explained it such so with such clarity. Um, but yeah, definitely kudos to that. Um, it's a very unique situation that we're in right now, um, given interest rates and given um, what those banks invested in what they thought was a safe move in normal times, but not so safe hindsight 2020, right? Um, yeah, definitely want to talk about how to create your own cryptocurrency. I think that in my investigation, investigations into that, the challenge is more about how to get people to use your project. I think it's the struggle there. Uh, there's a lot of resources for creating your own cryptocurrency. A lot of cryptocurrencies that we have today are actually built off of an existing cryptocurrency, right? Um, a good example is, you know, Dogecoin, you know, the meme coin with a dog on it is just a copy, if you will, of another cryptocurrency. Like they literally copied everything and changed the name on it. So it's, you know, it depends on how you want to build in unique characteristics um, to cryptocurrency is where probably the complexity comes from and marketing it, I think is the big part, but definitely something we could talk about um, in a session when you, when you chat and schedule one. Yeah. To that marketing point, I'm a big fan of oat milk, even though that is not really milk. So I think <laughs> I know what you mean. Um, thank you very much to everyone for your participation. Thank you, Alan. This was a fantastic presentation. Um, again, everyone, please sign up for our salary transparency uh, webinar coming up uh, later this semester. I would love to see everyone there. Um, and thank you again to everyone for your participation and your engagement this evening. We'll share the recording and slides afterwards. Alan, are there any uh, parting words you'd like to, to share with, with us? Yeah, I would say thank you to everyone for coming. I always appreciate seeing folks at these financial literacy workshops, and hopefully you learned a thing or two about cryptocurrency, especially if this is entirely new to you. And I'll see you in the next one. Thank you very much, Alan. Thank you again, everyone, and hope to see you at another event soon. Have a great evening. Take care, everyone. Take care. Thank you, Alan.